ನೀತಿ ತೊರೆಯುವ ನಾವು ಪರೀಕ್ಷೆ ಬರೆಯುವ ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ ವಾಣಿಯ ನಾವು ನೋಡಿ ಕಲಿಯುವ ಅಂಕಗಳೆಂದರೆ ಮೇಲಿನ ತೊಗಟೆ ವಿದ್ಯೆ ಅದರ ಒಳಗಿನ ತಿರುಳು ಭೀತಿ ತೊರೆಯುವ ನಾವು ಪರೀಕ್ಷೆ ಬರೆಯುವ ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ ವಾಣಿಯ ನಾವು ನೋಡಿ ಕಲಿಯುವ ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ ವಾಣಿಯ ನಾವು ನೋಡಿ ಕಲಿಯುವ ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ ವಾಣಿಯ ನಾವು ನೋಡಿ ಕಲಿಯುವ Namaste children, a warm welcome to all of you for this second session. I am TK Prasannamurthy from Bangalore. In the previous session we have discussed chapter number 4, Circles. Today uh, we are going to briefly revise another important unit, the next unit, the next chapter, chapter number 5, areas related to circles. Circular shape, you know, it is a very, very important shape that we come across very frequently in our daily life. Okay? Uh, we have seen the wheels, the tires of automobiles, see here, see the wheels see from a toy, I have, I am just showing it to you. So, this is in a circular shape, then the compact disc the CD you know this is also in the circular shape and then plates and jars utensils that we use in our kitchen and then base of a cone that of a cylinder and frustum etcetera they are all some of the important examples for circular shape. So, in this session it is worth to discuss about this circle, the circular shape certain important basic concepts of this. Okay. Children in this uh, table, a wonderful table, you have got lots of information that you can make out from this tabular columns. So, here we are going to mainly discuss two important concepts that is sector and segment of a circle, their related families and then combination of those two figures. So, it has altogether about 41 problems are there, excellent problems are there. Let us try to understand one by one. So, the first and the foremost uh, point to be discussed is the circumference of a circle. See, what do you mean by a circumference of a circle? Okay. Circumference of a circle is nothing but the length of the boundary one complete round. What is the length of this boundary? So, for that concept we use the word the term circumference suttalate. Okay? So, the in Kannada we go in, we are going to call it as suttalate. The length of this closed curve okay, is called the circumference of a circle. Okay. Circumference of a circle uh, here is a circle with a diameter and there also on the other side there is one more bigger circle and with the diameter we shall try to understand is there any relationship between the diameter and the length of this curve that is called the circumference. Let us try to explore it. You can see here in this bangle. Okay, See, look at the diameter and the circumference. It has some circumference for this diameter. So, there is another bangle here, it is little bigger. So, the diameter, you compare the diameter of these two bangles and the respective circumference. You can see here that as the diameter increases, the circumference also increases and as the diameter decreases, the circumference also decreases. So, this is one important relationship that we need to understand. That is what 
is we can understand from these two figures. So, circumference of a circle is directly proportional to its diameter. What do you mean by this statement proportion, direct proportion? Let us try to understand this. Symbolically, we write this as C proportional to D. This is alpha from uh, Greek. Okay. We, we should be read as proportion. Here, both of them are in numerator. Therefore, you must read it as C directly proportional to D. In other words, as diameter increases, so the circumference decreases, as diameter decreases, the circumference also decreases. So, this can be further explained like this by considering 3 to 4 circles, comparing them with their circumference. Here is a small circle with the diameter. Let us take the ratio between the circumference and diameter, call it as C1 by D1. One more circle, say a little bigger circle, it has so much of diameter. Take the ratio between their circumference and diameter, keep it aside. One more example, a bigger circle this time, again take the ratio between their circumference and the diameter. Like this, you can go on uh, finding the ratio for their circumference and diameter for any number of circles. Say here, let us call this as uh, the ratio as C n means the circumference of this circle divided by D n means the circumference, the diameter of this lost circle. And if you now observe this, compare all these quotients, you will see that C1 by D1 is equal to C2 by D2 and C2 by D2 is equal to C3 by D3 and C3 by D3 is always equal to Cn by Dn and Cn by Dn is equal to k, some constant k. So, in all these cases, however big the circle may be or smaller may be, the ratio between the circumference of the circle to its diameter is always a constant. So, if the quotient is a constant, we say this as this proportion as directly proportion, direct proportion. Okay. So, therefore, we can rewrite this as circumference of any circle divided by its diameter is always a constant, some constant, let us denote this constant by the letter k. Instead of the letter k, we use uh, or you can uh, uh, before that you can cross multiply this. So, c divided by 1 is c, k into d is k into d only and here this k is called as the proportionality constant, it is, the, it is called the constant of proportion. Now, instead of this k, now we are using a Greek alphabet that is pi only. So, therefore, uh, c is proportional to d or we can say this as in the form of an equation if you want to represent, you can call this as c is equal to pi into d. What does it mean? It means that if you want the circumference of a circle, you measure the diameter and multiply a particular value called the constant of proportion. In this case, it is equal to pi. Multiply those two, you will get the circumference of the circle. So, c is equal to pi times d. So, circumference of a circle is directly proportional to its diameter. Symbolically, we write like this. If you want to write it in the form of an equation, we write it as c is equal to pi times d, okay, where pi is instead of k, we are using pi here, it is called proportionality constant. So, if you write it in the form of words, it will you can read it like this circumference is equal to a constant pi times the diameter. So, if you multiply these two a diameter by a constant pi that will be equal to the circumference of the circle or you can put it like this circumference of a circle divided by diameter is nothing but that is the constant pi. Okay. Now, instead of diameter, can we not write since it is equal to twice the radius, we can write this c as pi times 2 r. Okay. So, now we can use the commutative property of multiplication and we can say it is equal to 2 pi r. 
So, if you multiply 2 pi and r the product of that will be equal to the circumference of the circle. Hence, this formula this is the formula to find the circumference of a circle. Now, let us take a particular example and find out what happens to the circumference if the radius is half a unit. So, we just now understood that circumference is 2 pi r ok in place of r you write substitute 2. So, 2 2 got cancelled and we get circumference is equal to pi. So, if the radius of a circle is half a unit then the circumference and that proportionality constant they will be both equal to each other. Now, let us consider one particular example for the circumference of a circle by taking wheels which are rotating we are moving like this and try to apply the formula c is equal to 2 pi r ok. Now, so this is one image you are seeing here also you are able to see this ok. What is the distance moved by a wheel in one rotation say it is moving like this when it moves for one complete rotation what is the distance it covers that is what we are interested to find out now. So, you know the distance travelled uh, by this uh, by a wheel uh, when it makes one rotation do not you think that is equal to the circumference of the circle. So, therefore, the distance moved by a wheel in one rotation it must be equal to the circumference of that wheel ok. Now, let us reverse this process if the distance travelled by a wheel is equal to its circumference then can we say that the number of rotations that made by it must be equal to 1 only. If the distance travelled by a wheel is exactly equal to its circumference then we may say that we can say that the number of rotation it has made is just one rotation. Now, it has travelled for 1 minute say if the distance travelled in 1 minute is x in such a case how many rotations it would have made. So, that is we are interested ok. So, if the distance travelled by 1 minute is x then let us find out ask a question what is the number of rotations that it is going to make. So, the number of rotations in 1 minute must be equal to the distance travelled in 1 minute divided by its circumference. So, if you divide the distance travelled in 1 minute by the circumference of that wheel you get the number of rotation because if the distance travelled by the wheel is equal to its circumference then it has made only one rotation. Now, it has made x distance it has travelled for x distance then in such a case how many rotations it has made for that we need to divide the distance moved in 1 minute divided by the circumference. Children please remember this this will help you to solve some good number of problems ok. Regarding pi I am just showing you here all the 24 alphabet of the Greek. So, these are the 24 alphabet alpha, beta, gamma, delta and so on and pi is the 16th letter see this is the 16th letter pi in this alphabet ok and uh, this is upper case this is lower case here we always we must use pi a uh, lower case only not the upper case please that small precaution we have to maintain ok. Now, having understood the circumference of a circle as 2 pi r let us try to understand what do you mean by the area of a circle ok. See look at this slide area of a circle means it is the amount of surface contained within the boundary of that figure here it the figure is circle. So, how much surface is there in this boundary? So, that amount of space the extent of the sorry surface is called the area of that circle. Surface means anything which has only two dimensions that is length and breadth. So, we wanted to find out how much of surface is there in this closed curve for that term we use the concept of area. So, area of circle means it is nothing but the extent of the amount of surface contained within that closed curve.
curve or the circle itself. Okay. Let us try to find out a suitable formula for the area of a circle. For this we have to uh, make divide a circle into as many number of sectors as possible. So, here is a small activity I wanted to demonstrate it to you. Okay. So, then look here please. So, here is uh, a, a plate which is in the form of a circle. We wanted to find out its area. So, the best method to find out the area is divide this region into as many number of sectors as possible. So, I have made here uh, 18 pieces like this. This is called a sector. So, let us try to arrange one by one like this children. Okay. So, now these are all the sectors we are trying to organize like this. <coughs> Okay. Okay, it's it's going to be getting completed. Okay. Okay, fine. See, the entire circular region is divided into 18 sectors here, but it is uh, possible to make as many number of good number of sectors as possible. In this, it is divided into 8 parts, this is 16 parts are there, here 32 parts are there. Now, using these uh, pieces, these sectors, you take one by one and try to organize like this in the form of a, a, a rectangle, a parallelogram like this. So, here also let us try to organize, here is a, a parallelogram, okay. here is a parallelogram, here is a parallelogram. Let us try to arrange these pieces one by one like this. Okay. Now, this is one sector, this is another sector. So, try to organize all these sectors like this. <coughs> Were you able to see children? See it is getting filled up now the entire parallelogram is covered with these sectors of equal area, they are all of equal area. Okay. Now, the last one if it is exactly here, okay. yes so nicely organized. So, the same thing you are seeing here. Okay. Now, if we know that how to we know how to find the area of this parallelogram and the area of this parallelogram is nothing but area of this circle. So, what is the area of this parallelogram? So, base into the uh, corresponding altitude. As you increase the number of pieces, you can see the parallelogram is slowly trying to become a rectangle, but here it is a parallelogram. If you increase into good number of sectors, then this will become a rectangle. In such a case, the rectangle area is nothing but length into breadth. What is the length of this? The length of this equal to sum of the, the lengths of these curves plus these curves, the top and the bottom. Okay, That will add up to the circumference of this circle. So, therefore, we can say that the circumference you already know it has 2 pi r and here the opposite sides are equal. So, the length from here to here is pi r, this is pi r, pi r plus pi r is 2 pi r. Now, what is the breadth? Breadth is nothing but the radius of these sectors. So, now if you multiply these two length into breadth, you get area of a circle is equal to pi r square. Okay. So, the area of this is nothing but pi r square. 
So, the circumference of a circle is nothing but 2 pi r whereas, the area of a circle is nothing but pi r square. So, how we got this formula? So, by dividing the circular region into as many number of sectors as possible and placing them in a rectangle or parallelogram like this. Since, we know the area of a rectangle or a parallelogram using this concept we can easily find out the area of a, a circle which is nothing but so pi r into r which is nothing but pi r square. Okay. Now, uh, let us say that uh, in there some in one particular case uh, we find the area of a circle and that of the circumference also and say numerically if they are numerically equal then what will happen to the radius or how much will be the radius. So, area is equal to circumference numerically you know just now we understood pi r square as the area and 2 pi r as the circumference. So, pi r square is equal to 2 pi r. So, pi pi got cancelled and the square and this r got cancelled and r is equal to 2. So, if the radius of a circle is 2 units then the uh, area and the circumference will be numerically they will be equal. This is one additional point for you. So, let us do uh, one small verification. Area is pi r square, circumference is 2 pi r and we have found out radius as 2. So, let us substitute 2 here. So, pi into 2 square. So, there 2 pi into 2. So, this is nothing but 4 pi, 2 square is 4, 4 pi and circumference is also 4 pi. So, this is possible only when the radius is 2 units. Okay. Now, we are seeing one important uh, uh, bakery product you know uh, this we have tasted so many times this is called dil pasand. So, this looks like this you know this is uh, looking like a curve and here is one radius this is another radius this is something connected to circle only. Okay. So, this is called a sector of a circle, this kind of a shape wherever you see it is called sector of a circle. So, let us try to understand what do you mean by sector of a circle. So, here is a circle with center O and choose any two points on the circumference. Uh, so, call it as A and B. So, this is radius and O B is also radius. So, take two radius and again any point on this minor arc call it as C. Now, this is the minor arc and O A C B this region is called the sector of a circle. As you seen in Dilpasand also, it is I'm saying it, it, it resembles this uh, this shape. Therefore, it is called a uh, sector of it. Such kind of a shape is called as sector of a circle. So, can you now? I mean, you can see the shaded portion. We are trying to shade it also and show that this region is called as the sector of a circle. So, is it possible to define what is a sector of a circle? Yes, sector of a circle is nothing but the region that is the area bounded by two radii on one side and an arc on the other side. So, such a figure is called as the sector of a circle. Now, here the angle at the center subtended by this arc let us call it as theta. So, now using this angle only we are going to measure what is the area of this, the length of the arc and so many other things can be easily calculated using the angle at the center subtended by this arc. So, a sector is measured by the angle it subtends at the center of the circle because as theta increases or decreases the area also decreases or increases. Okay. As it increases the area increases, as it decreases area also decreases. So, therefore, with the help of this using this small concept we shall now try to find out what is the formula for the area of a sector. Before that 
two more points to be understood. Here this OACB is called the minor sector. This is a small portion when compared to this sector. This is called minor sector and this one the, the uh, shaded one in red color is called you choose a point anywhere on the major or call it as D and OADB this region is called as the major sector. So, this is a bigger one when compared to this, this is the minor sector and this is the major sector. Now, another interesting term we, we, we need to understand that is called the segment of a circle. So, what do you mean by the segment of a circle? See, there is a lot of difference between a sector and a segment. Segment is this, this portion which has been highlighted here. So, this is the chord you know, the A B is a chord and this is a minor arc A C B and this area, this region bounded by this chord and this arc is called the segment of a circle. So, let us try to define this now as like this, it is nothing but a figure bounded by a card on one side and an arc on the other side. So, this is called the uh, segment of a circle. Okay. Here also you will see minor segment and uh, major segment, this is called minor segment and this region is called as the major segment. Okay. And uh, now, let us try to compare the sector of a circle with the uh, segment of a circle. Here are the two uh, figures are coming to you. So, this region is called the minor sector whereas, this region is called as the minor segment okay. and this region is called as the major sector and this portion is called as the major segment. So, major segment minor segment, major sector and minor sector. So, have a clear idea about the sector of a circle and segment of a circle. Now, let us find out a suitable formula, a simple formula to find the area of a sector. See what is the logic behind it. If the angle at the center is 360 degrees, okay, here is a figure, here is a circle, here is the center and the angle at the center is 360 degree. If this is the angle at the center is 360 degree, then what is the area of the circle? The area of the circle is total one which is equal to pi r square. Now, we are not taking the whole angle at the center, we are taking a small portion of it like this. So, this is a small portion here angle is theta. If theta is the angle at the center, what is the area of that sector? So, that can be found out like this. So, that is equal to multiply pi r square and this theta and this one you divide it by 360 degrees in order to get the area if this sector. Okay. See look at this small logic here, if the angle at the center is 360 degrees, then the total area is pi r square. If the angle is at the center is just theta degrees, what would be the area of this sector which is nothing but pi r square into theta divided by 360 degree. It can be better expressed in this way. So, let us write down the angle together as theta divided by 360 degree times pi r square. I think this would be better instead of this pi r square into theta by 360 degree. It would be very easy convenient for us to remember it as theta by 360 degree times pi r square. So, theta divided by 360 degree times pi r square will give us the area of this sector and this kind of a method or approach is called as unitary method. Okay? Yes. Now, area of a sector we have understood it as theta by 360 degrees times pi r square, a very small formula you can easily remember this okay? provided you have understood the unitary method this can be easily remembered. Now, let us consider four examples, let us uh, say that angle at the center is 360 degree, then it will be the area of sector will be 1 twelfth of pi r square, if it is 60 it will be 1 sixth of pi r square. 
if it is 90 naturally it has to be one fourth you know one fourth of pi r square and finally, if the angle is 180 degree it has to be half of the area of the circle. So, the, the these things could be we have worked out using this formula only therefore, please remember area of a sector as theta by 360 degree times pi r square. Now, if you can write this this formula in terms of words it would be still it, we can get impressed and we can easily remember this. So, area of a sector is theta is nothing but angle at the center divided by 360 degree times the area of the circle. I think this would be still better way to remember for quite for a quite a long time we can have this kind of a formula also try to express in words. So, that you can remember for a very long time to come. So, this is the area of a sector. Now, we can we have any alternate formula for area of a sector? Yes, there is one more formula is there which we will discuss now. Okay. Now, if the length of the arc is 2 pi r then what is the area of the circle if this is the length of the complete circumference which is 2 pi r if the length of the arc is 2 pi r then the area of the circle is pi r square. If the length of the arc is just L like this in this figure you are able to see here. So, this is A B is the minor arc if this is the length of the arc then what is the area of this uh, sector. So, again pi r square into L or L divided by 2 pi r into pi r square ok this is the formula ok. So, now you can simplify this r pi and pi and r and with this square also get cancelled. So, 1 by 2 the divided by 2 can be written as 1 by 2 into length of the r into radius. So, the area of a sector can also be expressed in terms of the length of the r as half into length of the r into radius. So, now let us find out what is the length of the arc now. Okay. So, that can be found out again by unitary method only. So, if the angle at the center is 360 degrees then the length of the arc is 2 pi r and if the angle at the center is 360 uh, just theta degrees what would be the length of the arc again the same way. So, multiply this uh, 2 pi r into atwa, just theta by 360 degree times 2 pi r simplify 2 and 360 can be easily written as. So, theta by 180 degree times pi r. So, here we do not have 2 pi r here children 2 and 360 have been cancelled and here 180 is there just here pi r is there. So, this is the formula to find the length of the r please remember it is 3 uh, theta by 180 it is not 360 because 2 and 1360 we have simplified we are getting here 180 and this is there is no 2 here to have been already cancelled. Okay. So, uh, we can just sum up uh, the 3 formulas like this. So, area of a sector is theta by 360 degree times pi r square or half into L into r and the length of arc is equal to theta by 180 times pi r. Now, area of a segment if you want area of the segment A P B this minor segment if you want what is that we have to do you have to take this whole sector in this sector if you subtract area of this circle that will give the area of this segment minor segment A P B that it can be written as you know what is the area of this sector it is theta by 360 degree times pi r square minus area of the triangle. After a 2 3 slides I am going to tell you how to find the area of a triangle also ok that I will take you later. Now, now let us take a major sector and a major segment and try to find out what is the formula to calculate the areas. So, major sector means this one O A Q B. So, if you want the area of that so take the entire circle area from that you subtract the minor sector O A P B so that you will get the area of major sector. 
if you want major segment means a q b if you want this area again take the area of the circle and from that we have to subtract area of the minus segment a p b if you subtract this area from the entire area so you will get the area of the major segment okay so now let us find out we want this also what is the area of this triangle here the angle at the center is theta this is these are the radii we want the area of this triangle you know that it is equal to half base into height so the same one so we can express in a still better way so we need the height without height it is not possible to find so let us draw a perpendicular from b to oa so this angle is 90 let us call the foot of the perpendicular as c and bc is the height if you take this as the base this will be the height so area of triangle obc this right angle triangle area of right angle triangle obc is equal to so uh, in this triangle let us find out the theta for this theta what is the sine of this angle theta sin theta is opposite side by hypotenuse so b c this is the height this is hypotenuse sorry this is uh, the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse so and b c is nothing but h because is the perpendicular h divided by b o is nothing but the radius okay now if you cross multiply you will get the height of this uh, triangle as r into sin theta so now we have expressed the height of this triangle in terms of the radius and this theta so look at the advantage of learning trigonometry so the height is expressed in terms of radius and the sign of the angle at the center now you can find out the area of the triangle using half base into height so half into oa you can make any one side as the base but we are trying to make this side as the base and finding the area so area is equal to half into base length equal to radius therefore into r into bc the height if we have found out is as r sin theta on simplification you get half r square sin theta so using this formula you can find out the area of a triangle so area of the triangle is expressed in terms of radius and the sign of the angle are uh, subtended at the center now in our textbook there are six worked examples are there given on area related to circles wonderful problems are there so let me take the last example the sixth example and it is this so here is a square a b c d so okay and here are the four uh, semi circles that have been drawn by making each side as the diameter let us call these areas as a b c d and in our textbook it is given like this uh, each side is uh, 10 units and we are interested in finding out what is the sum of the areas of these four regions that is we wanted a plus b plus c plus d is equal to now here is one simple uh, uh, drawing has been made on corrugated sheet you can see the same problem here so we wanted what is the area of a plus b plus c plus d equal to it is a very interesting problem i wanted to just share it with you now okay let us start yes um, let the remaining areas of this square be p q r s these are the remaining areas let the area of this is p this is q this is r and this is s yes. so apart from a b c d the whatever the remaining portions are there in the square let the let us call them as p q r and s yes. okay with this let us find out uh, one important thing areas of the all the four semicircles this is one semicircle this is another semicircle let us find out the areas of all the four semicircles let us do it one by one let us consider this semicircle this is equal to a plus p plus b will give us the area of semicircle one uh, if you want this semicircle it is b plus q plus c and area of this is equal to d plus r plus c and area of this is equal to d plus s plus a 
Now, let us try to add all the four uh, semicircle area and you know it is a plus a is 2 a, b plus b is 2 b, c plus c is 2 d and d plus d is 2 d, p, q, r, s are appearing only once therefore, it has to be equal to 2 a plus 2 b plus 2 c plus 2 d plus p plus q plus r plus s. This is the sum of the areas of four semicircle. let us keep it in one side. Okay. So, in the next slide you are seeing just now we have found out this area of the four semicircles. Now, let us find out area of the square now. Okay. So, area of square is equal to a plus p plus b plus q plus c plus r plus d plus s. So, some of the areas of all these eight regions will give us the area of the square a b c d. Now, what is the next thing? So, you know the areas of four semicircles and the area of square. We wanted what is the sum of these areas of these four regions. For that, we need to subtract this from the total area. Let us now find out the areas of four semicircles from this subtract area of the square. Okay, area of four semicircles is this minus area of the square is this. So, this is followed by minus the so minus a minus p minus b and so on. So, you now you, you can easily simplify this plus p this became because of this minus it became minus p for the same reason q is getting cancelled r and s are also getting cancelled. Now, 2 a minus a is a and 2 b minus b is b and again c plus d plus d. So, if you want the area of this four region, what is that we have to do? We have to take the areas of four semicircle. From that, if you subtract the area of the square, that will be equal to the sum of these four regions. So, now this is nothing but the difference is nothing but sum of the areas of four regions. So, therefore, we can highlight like this if you want the sum of the areas of these four regions, it is nothing but the areas of four semicircle. From that, you have to subtract the area of the square so that you get the area of A plus B plus C plus D. It is very easy to remember also now. Let us take it little forward children. Uh, now, A plus B plus C plus D area, we just now understood it as areas of four semicircles from that area of square we have to subtract. So, what is the area of one circle means pi r square? This is half of that. So, pi r square by 2. So, pi r square by 2 there are 4 times you have to take half pi r square, half pi r square, half pi r square, half pi r square which is nothing but 2 pi r square. Okay, 2 pi r square will give us the areas of 4 semicircles minus what is the area of this square. Okay, this semicircle radius is r. Okay. So, therefore, diameter has to be 2 r. So, the diameter of each semicircle is 2 r, therefore, each side is 2 r, 2 r into 2 r which is 4 r square. So, 2 pi r square minus 4 pi r square will give us the a plus sum of the areas of a plus b plus c plus d. Can you not simplify this? So, you can very well see here 2 r square is common factor. So, 2 r square into pi minus 2. Let us simplify this part this factor pi minus 2 by taking pi as approximately equal to 22 by 7. So, this on simplification will become 8 by 7. So, pi minus 2 is approximately 8 by 7. So, let us substitute here 2 r square into 8 by 7. So, 8 to the 16, 16 by 7 times r square. So, therefore, area of the shaded region in red color is nothing but 16 by 7 times r square. Children, in the same way you can work out all the remaining problems given in our textbook. So, that in future for any competitive examination these kind of problems will appear then you will be able to solve all those problems in detail very neatly also quickly also. Okay. Now, um, therefore, a plus b plus c plus d is equal to 16 by 7 times r square. 
So, using the radius of the each semicircle only we can easily found out the area of the sum of the areas of those four regions. Now, in, the, in this chapter there is uh, one exercise 5.3 there are 16 excellent problems are there please try to solve them. Now, here is one example given in our textbook see here. We are, we, are, we are given O as the center of this circle and uh, we need to give they have given some data which I will tell you. We have to find out area of this shaded region which is in green color this plus the small piece we have to find out area of this region. So, let me try to explain this to you now. Okay. What is data given? Area of the shaded portion is equal to Okay. Now, area of the uh, semicircle from that we have to subtract what is that we have to subtract area of this right angle triangle. If you subtract this you will get the area of this shaded portion. Okay. Now, area is equal to area of semicircle area of circle is pi r square you want semi half of that. So, pi r square by 2 from that you have to subtract area of this right angle triangle A is which is nothing but half into B into H. Now, let us find out the area separately pi r square by 2 is nothing but 1 by 2 we will write separately into pi is approximately equal to 22 by 7 radius diameter is 25 they have given this okay and this has 24 centimeter if the the sides containing the right angle are 7 and 24 then the hypotenuse has to be 25 they are pythagorean triplets so when diameter is 25 half of that is 12.5 so radius is 12.5 r square means into another 12.5 so this is the area of the semi circle so this on simplification 12.5 into 12.5 is 156.25 and this multiplied by 22 will become 3457.5. So, and if you divide this by 14 this upon dividing it by 14 will become 245.53. So, this is the area of this semi circle. Now, let us find out the area of the right angle triangle half B H which is nothing but half into if this is the base this side which is perpendicular to it will become the height. So, half into 7 into 24. So, the 2 uh, 12s are and 12 8s are 84. So, 84 square centimeter is the area of this right angle triangle. Now, if you want the area of this shaded portion what is that we have to do you know it is equal to the difference between area of semicircle and area of this right angle triangle. So, this is 244.53 minus 84 which is equal to 161.53. So, children uh, we have understood another important chapter we have briefly revised a uh, very very important chapter very small chapter indeed chapter number 5 area related to circles and there are good number of problems are there please try to work out all the problem so that you can do very well in the coming examination. We all from this end wish you all the best. Thank you children. Namaste once again. Hello children. Hope all of you are doing well, you are reading well, you are preparing well for your exams. To help you study for your exams, we are going to revise another chapter in science today, our environment. This chapter as all, all of you know has been allotted 2 marks. Environment. What is environment? The surroundings in which the living beings live are called as environment. Now, as you can see here, these are all the environment which you find everywhere. The rivers, the forests, the mountains, the oceans and all your habitats. Any environment consists of two components, the biotic component and the abiotic component. The biotic and the abiotic components in an environment interact with each other 
and maintain balance in the nature. So you can see here there are two components here. So these components are the biotic components which comprise of the living organisms including the plants and the animals and coming to the other side you can see the abiotic components. So these are the abiotic components and these are the biotic components. Now let us see what is an ecosystem. An ecosystem is the interaction between the living and the non-living constituents of the environment. So if this is the environment, you can see the plants, the water and the, all the abiotic components along with the biotic components interacting with each other. All organisms such as plants, animals, microorganisms as well as physical surroundings interact with each other and in an ecosystem this interaction is very essential. An ecosystem consists of biotic components comprising of the living organisms and the abiotic components comprising of factors like temperature, rainfall, soil, minerals, etc. Now let us see what are the components of an ecosystem. Basically there are two components, the abiotic components and the biotic components. The abiotic factors include the soil, the air, the light, the water, the humidity, etc. And now coming to the biotic components. The biotic components comprises of all the living beings in the environment. So there are basically three biotic components according to the manner in which they obtain their sustenance from the environment. First of all, the first biotic component is the producers. Now what are producers? Producers are organisms which can make organic compounds like sugar and starch from inorganic substances using the radiant energy of the sun. What are the producers? Examples of producers are all the green plants and certain bacteria. Now you can see these are the green plants and these are the bacteria. Chemosynthetic bacteria can obtain their own food. And the second biotic component are the con consumers. The consumers are organisms which consume the food produced either directly by the producers or indirectly by feeding on other con consumers and these organisms are called as the consumers. For example, all the animals. These are the animals that you have seen. These are the organisms which consume food produced directly or indirectly by the producers. And the third component are the decomposers. So now what are decomposers? These are organisms which decompose and break down organic substances in dead organisms and replenish the abiotic soil are called as the decomposers. Now let us see few examples of decomposers, bacteria and fungi. Now you can see this is the dead decaying matter, so which will be composed by the bacteria and the fungi. The consumers are of three kinds. So now let us study each one of them. The primary consumers are organisms which depend on the producers directly for food. Generally they are called as herbivores. So for example, deer, insects, cow, etc. Now you can see here, these are the deer which feed directly on the plants. Likewise, the insect and the cow. There are yet another type of consumers called as the secondary consumers. These are the organisms which depend on the primary consumers for their food. They are generally called as carnivores, those animals which eat the herbivores. Now you, you can see certain examples over here. A bird, a tiger, a lion or a dog. There are yet another type of consumers called as the tertiary consumers. And these organisms depend on the secondary consumers for their food. They are also called as secondary carnivores. Example eagle, human beings, etc. Now let us see what is a food chain. Now you saw what are consumers. The consumers are organisms which consume the food that is produced by the producer. The producer will produce the food which in turn will be consumed by the primary consumer, the secondary consumer and the tertiary consumer. So all these organisms are interrelated through food. So now this is called a food chain. Now let's see what is a food chain. The transfer of energy in the form of food from one organism to another is called a food chain. Each step of the food chain is called a trophic level. 
Now you can see a food chain over here. There are various organisms interlinked into this food chain. So you can see the plants, you can see the insects, you can see the frog, you can see the snake and you can see the owl. All of them are interconnected through food. So and this is called as a food chain. So you can see another example over here. There are certain important aspects to be known in a food chain. The trophic level 1 in a food chain will always be occupied by a producer which are autotrophs. That means which can synthesize their own food, which can produce their own food like the plants. And in trophic level 2, it will be generally occupied by primary consumers like the herbivores. Trophic level 3 will be occupied by secondary consumers like these which depend on the primary consumers. And the trophic level 4 will be occupied by tertiary consumers like this which will depend on the secondary consumers. There are different types of food chain. Now let's study each one of them. The first kind of food chain is called as the grazing food chain. So here the primary consumer will be always a herbivore. In a food chain, to decide the type of food chain, we generally consider the primary consumer. If the primary consumer is a herbivore, then that food chain is called as a grazing food chain. So now you can see an example over here. This is an example of the food chain in an ocean. So here you can see phytoplanktons, which are the producers, which are eaten by the protozoa, which is a zooplankton. And the protozoa are in turn eaten by the small fish and the small fish are eaten by the big fish. So now since here the protozoa is the primary consumer and the protozoa feeds on the phytoplankton, which is a producer, this food chain is called as the grazing food chain because the protozoa here is a herbivore. In all these food chains, you can see that the primary consumer is always a herbivore. Hence, these are examples for grazing food chains. The second kind of food chain is the detritivorous food chain. Here, the primary consumer will always be a detritivore. And who is a detritivore? It is an organism which obtains its food from dead and decaying organic matter. There are various examples like the ant, the earthworm, the crab, the centipede. So I will just give you an example over here. See, there is a fallen leaf on which an earthworm feeds. The earthworm is in turn eaten by a bird. Here, the earthworm is feeding on a fallen leaf. The fallen leaf is dead and decaying matter. You can see here. This is eaten by the earthworm. Since it is eating the dead and decaying organic matter, it is called as a detritivore. And this will be in turn eaten by the bird. So now, here, the primary consumer earthworm is a detritivore, hence this chain is called as a detritivorous food chain. There is yet another kind of food chain called as the parasitic food chain. This is the third type of food chain. Here the primary consumer is a parasite. A parasite is an organism which depends on another organism, the host organism for its needs for food and shelter. So now here is an example, tree, bird, lice and fungi. Now, how, how do you say this is a parasitic food chain? The tree is a producer as usual. It is in the first trophic level. The second trophic level is the primary consumer, the bird. Now, how can we call this as a parasitic food chain? The bird is a parasite on the fruits produced by the tree. And in turn, the lice which lives in the bird is a parasite for the bird. And the fungi which live on the lice or parasites for the lice. So the entire food chain is occupied by parasites. That's why this food chain is called as a parasitic food chain. The entire food chain is occupied by parasites. Hence, this food chain is called as the parasitic food chain. So now you can see here, this is a tree which produces the fruit. The bird eats the fruit. The lice live in the body of the bird and the fungi leave or the lies. Let us discuss another concept called the food web. A food web is mainly a interrelated food chain. There are many food chains which are interrelated in an ecosystem. One organism is eaten by many other organisms and each of them are interrelated. 
In an ecosystem, the food chains form a complex interconnection with each other, which is called as a food web. We can understand the subtle relationship of the ecological balance that is there in nature from these food chains and food webs. So now we can see a food web. Here, this is an ocean food chain which forms a food food web. So you can see here there are many food chains. There are many food chains, and when you see one organism is eaten by one or more other organisms. So what will happen? So if one organism is removed from the trophic level, or for example, if there is something and that ex organism become becomes extinct, then the other organism which was supposed to eat that organism will not be able to get its food and that will also be destroyed so here you can see there is a imbalance created in the nature so to understand the food chain and the food web it is very very important to understand the balance in the nature and let's see what is a biosphere so a biosphere includes those part of the earth in which the living organisms live it it can be the hydrosphere the atmosphere the lithosphere or the any part of the earth where you find living organisms now let us see a few technical points of the ecology so ecology and environmental science both are the same it means the study of living organisms and their relationship with their environment the study of living organisms and their uh, relationship with the environment is called as ecology or environmental science so now these are the different spheres the geosphere the atmosphere the biosphere and the hydrosphere so these are where you find the organisms so wherever you find the organisms either either in the geosphere or the atmosphere or the hydrosphere that part of the earth is called as the biosphere so now let's see how the energy flows in an ecosystem or how it works the autotrophs fix up the solar energy and makes it available for the heterotrophs or the consumers for further consumption the autotrophs or the producers they obtain 1% of the energy from the sun and prepare the food they fix up the solar energy in the form of food energy the herbivores are the primary consumers which come at the second uh, level and the small carnivores are the secondary carnivores which come at the third level and the large carnivores are the tertiary consumers which come at the fourth trophic level all of them they depend on the energy produced by the reusers if you can see here this is a pyramid where you have placed the producers the primary consumers the secondary consumers and the tertiary consumers and you can see the relationship the producers are eaten by the primary consumers uh, are, they are in turn eaten by the secondary consumers which are in turn eaten by the tertiary consumers and the energy is also transferred in the same manner how does the energy flow in an ecosystem the energy flow in an ecosystem is always unidirectional it can never flow back it always flows from one trophic level to another trophic level from one trophic level 1 to trophic level 2 and to 3 and to 4 not from 4 to 3 3 to 2 or 2 to 1 why is that so energy flows in the form of food from one trophic level to another so now we can see here the energy flow is unidirectional and it can never trans get transferred from the carnivores to the herbivores definitely not because no herbivore will eat a carnivore it's the otherwise the herbivores are intonated by the carnivores that is why it is unidirectional and it cannot be cyclic and this transfer of energy from one trophic level to another trophic level is guarded by a law called as the 10% law that means only 10% of the energy gets transferred from one trophic level to another trophic level in any ecosystem now why is that so the remaining energy that is the other 90% of the energy will be consumed by the organism for its life activities 
metabolic activities, its growth, its development, its reproduction and other activities that take place in the body of the organism. So, it takes up 90% of the energy that it receives and only 10% of the energy will be transferred to the other trophic level. So, now if you can see here, the producers are obtaining the energy from the sun and they are fixing it up in the form of food. So, that will be in turn consumed by the primary consumers and these primary consumers will pass it on to the secondary and the tertiary consumers. Meanwhile, these organisms will require energy for their activities. So, that and some amount of heat also will escape heat energy. So, the remaining 10% from the producers will pass on to the primary consumers and from the primary consumers, it will pass again another 10%. So, likewise, until it reaches the last level of the food chain. Our food grains such as wheat, rice, vegetable fruits and even meat containing various amount of pesticide residues we actually use to protect them from the pests. Why? Because they cannot always be removed by washing or any other means. So, what happens? Most of these chemicals are not degradable and they end up getting stored in each trophic level through the food chains. These chemicals reach the soil and water bodies through rainwater. The plants absorb these water from the soil and now this gets transferred to the animals through the food chain. Now, as all of you know, we are human beings and we occupy the highest trophic level possible in any food chain. So, these chemicals, they get accumulated in maximum quantities in our body. This phenomenon is called as biological magnification where the chemical gets magnified from one trophic level to another trophic level. It gets stored on and the percentage increases from one trophic level to another trophic level. Now, we can see a few examples here. This shows the increase in the concentration of mercury in each trophic level. Starting from the phytoplanktons to the zooplanktons, the small fish, the, produce, the larger fish and the birds or the mammals which consume them in turn. So, here it goes on increasing from one trophic level to another trophic level and the ultimate trophic level will have the maximum concentration of that chemical. Now, you can see another concentration. All of us know that DDT it is a chemical which was banned long ago. Now, we find this chemical even today in our body. So, now why? This is because uh, this is the result of biological magnification where we find DDT in our body. So, now you can see here the percentage of DDT has magnified to the maximum extent starting from the water to the producers, the zooplanktons, the small fish, the large fish, the birds and the mammals and the human beings which in turn eat them. Now, let us understand few questions that might crop up in this chapter. So, there is a question, very simple question, which is the source of energy for the producers? What amount of energy do they receive from the source? Why is energy flow always unidirectional? So, these are very, very simple questions, which is the source of energy for the producers? Of course, it is the sun. And what amount of energy do they receive from that source? It is 1 percent that they receive from the sun. So, now why is energy flow always unidirectional? It is because the producers are eaten by the consumers and not the otherwise. The consumers will not eat the producers. That is why the energy flow is always unidirectional. Now, there is another question. In a food chain, the producers are fixed around 1000 kilocalories of energy. How much energy will be transferred to the next trophic level or ultimately the fourth trophic level? So, it can be asked anyway. So, now if you have to use the 10 percent law to answer this question. So, 1000 kilocalories is in the producers. So, from the producers, 10 percent will go to the primary consumer, the second trophic level. So, the second trophic level will receive 
ten percent of thousand hundred. And now from that it will go to the third profit level that is the secondary consumer. So that will that will make ten of hundred, which is ten. The fourth profit level will receive another ten percent of the ten, which will be one. So the fourth profit level will receive. One kilo calorie of the thousand kilo calorie energy fixed by the producers. And now there is another question: What are the why are the trophic levels limited to four or five? That's very obvious because most of the energy is utilized by the organism itself for its for its various activities. The amount of energy that is transferred to the next level is very very less. So, if we take another trophic level, the amount of energy that will be received after the fifth trophic level is very, very, very small. So, generally, it will be restricted to four or five. The trophic levels will be restricted to four or five. There is another question: Which organism should be more in number in an ecosystem? It's very simple. The number of producers in any ecosystem should be more for the sustenance of that. Ecosystem for the ecosystem to be stable, it should be more in number. There is another question: Can a drop of water or from a pond be considered as a complete ecosystem? Now you have to justify your answer for this. Uh, just a drop of water from a pond, can you consider it as a complete ecosystem? Definitely, you can call this as a complete ecosystem because in a drop of pond water, you can see. There are microorganisms. The phytoplanktons are there, which are the producers, and there are zooplanktons, which are in turn eaten by the small fish. And there are abiotic components like the air, the water, the soils, the minerals, etc. So this makes a drop of water a complete ecosystem. Which among the following is the character of an artificial ecosystem? Now you have to see the options. Biodiversity is less. Biodiversity is more. It is more stable and it is man-made. Biodiversity will be less, but not completely less. Biodiversity, uh, biodiversity cannot be more because it's an artificial ecosystem and it is not more stable, but it is man-made. So hence the option is man-made. There is another question: the number of organisms in an ecosystem is like this. The producers are thousand in number. The primary consumers are two thousand in number. The secondary consumers are two hundred in number, and the tertiary consumers are hundred in number. Now the question is: You have to verify whether this ecosystem is stable, and you have to justify your answer. So now you can see the primary in any ecosystem, the producer should always be more in number. So to be sustainable, to be a stable environment, to be a stable ecosystem. The producer should be more in number. Now, here in this ecosystem, the producers are thousand, and the primary consumers are more. If the primary consumers are more, definitely the producers will again come down in number. So, this cannot be a very stable ecosystem. This is how you have to justify your answer. There is another question: What will happen if you remove all the organisms of one trophic level? In an ecosystem at once. So, what will happen if all the organisms in one trophic level are removed, be it primary consumers or secondary consumers? Definitely, it will create an imbalance in the environment because the primary consumers are the source of food for the secondary consumer. If we remove the primary consumer, the secondary consumers will not get their food, and so on. So, this will create an imbalance in the environment. You can see a question over here: phytoplanktons, zooplanktons, small fish, and large fish. This is a food chain. So there is something given. The phytoplanktons have 100 kilojoules of energy. The zooplanktons have 10 kilojoules. The small fish have 1 kilojoule, and the large fish, the large fish, 0.1 kilojoules. So now, what can you inform from this question? So this question generally represents the flow of energy in a Ecosystem. This is the ten percent law. There are two answers. Either it can be the ten percent law or the flow of energy. There are similar questions which can be 
asked. Now let's see. So in few questions, the amount of energy for in one trophic level may be given. Say for example, let's take this example. The zoo plankton sure have ten kilojoules of energy. So they will just give you a food chain with all the other organisms. They will just give. So for example, zoo planktons have ten kilojoules of energy. Now calculate the amount of energy that the phytoplanktons may have. Again, you have to go for the calculation. So since the zoo planktons are the primary consumers, it is that they have received only the ten percent. So you have to calculate. So it will make up to hundred kilojoules for the phytoplanktons. Or it might be the other ways. They might give you this food chain and ask you to find the amount of energy that will be transferred to the large fish. So now, since it is in the fourth uh, trophic level, you know how to calculate. It will be zero point one kilojoules. Likewise, the amount of non-biodegradable chemicals in each level in an increasing order may be given and asked you for the identification. If that is given. If an increase in the amount of the like parts per million of certain chemical is given in each trophic level of the certain food chain, you have to understand that this is a result of bio magnification, and that phenomenon you have to identify is bio magnification. Now there is yet another question: Which of the following constitutes a food chain? There are four options here: grass, wheat, mango, grass, goat, and human, cow. Goat, elephant, grass, fish, and goat. Now you have to clearly see what it means. Grass, wheat, and mango are all producers, producers and products of producers. So, so you cannot make a food chain. To make a food chain, you would have a producer, a primary consumer, a secondary consumer. A minimum of these three organisms should be there. So now coming to the second option, the grass, goat, and the human being. Definitely, the goat can eat the grass, and the humans can eat the Goat. Now coming to the third option, the goat, cow, and the elephant. Here, all the three are herbivores, so they cannot form a food chain. So now coming to the fourth one, do you have a producer, a secondary consumer, and a primary consumer? The grass is not eaten by the fish, or the grass, even if it is eaten by the goat, cannot be eaten by the fish. So you cannot constitute a food chain by any else. Other than the option B, grass, goat, and human beings. There is another question. There are bacteria and fungi on a tree in an ecosystem. They are known by this name. You have to identify by which name they are called or they are identified in an ecosystem. The options are producers, primary consumers, decomposers, or Secondary consumers. All of us know that the bacteria and fungi are detritivores and they are decomposers. There is yet another question: What will happen if there are no decomposers in an ecosystem? If there are no decomposers in an ecosystem, then the balance of the ecosystem is not maintained. Why? Because the decomposers they play a very important role in maintaining the balance of the ecosystem. They replenish the soil. Back by decomposing the dead and decaying organic matter. Otherwise, the producers will not be able to obtain their nutrients. Another question: What are the effects of extension of an organism on a food chain or a food web? Here we can see that if an organism from from one trophic level is removed, then the organisms which depend on this organism will also face a danger of extinction, and thereby there is an imbalance created in the Food chain or the ecosystem. Let's learn another concept about the ozone layer and its depletion. But as for that, we have to first understand what is ozone layer and why it is getting depleted. So now you can see a picture of the Earth, which is covered by the layers. So now, what is ozone? Ozone is a molecule which is formed by three atoms of oxygen. Ozone layer is present in the stratosphere of the atmosphere at a distance of 15 to 60 km from the earth. This layer protects the living organism on the earth from the harmful ultraviolet rays of the sun. So now you can see here the ultraviolet rays are coming from the sun and the ozone layer it forms a protective layer around the earth 
and it filters the ultraviolet rays thereby it protects the earth ozone is a molecule formed by three atoms of oxygen as i already told you while oxygen all of you know we require oxygen it is the essential nutrient or the essential gaseous element that is required that is used by all aerobic forms of life but ozone which has three molecules of oxygen is a deadly poison oxygen we refer to as normal oxygen or o2 which is essential for all living organisms ozone at the higher levels of the atmosphere is a product of the uv radiation acting on oxygen molecule the higher energy uv radiation the split apart some molecular oxygen o2 into free oxygen or nascent oxygen o these atoms in turn combine with the molecular oxygen to form the ozone that means the nascent oxygen o will combine with oxygen o2 to form o3 that is the ozone now you can see here the oxygen is split into nascent oxygen by the uv rays and this nascent oxygen in turn reacts with the oxygen to form the ozone the amount of ozone in the atmosphere began to drop sharply in the 1980s this decrease has been linked to the synthetic chemicals like the chlorofluorocarbons which are used in refrigerants and in fire extinguishers you can see the fire extinguishers and the refrigerators where the cfcs will be used In 1987 the United Nations Environment Program succeeded in forging an agreement to freeze the CFC production at the 1986 levels. So now it is mandatory for all the manufacturing companies to make CFC free refrigerators throughout the world. The ozone layer is being damaged by the chlorofluorocarbons or the CFCs used in these refrigerators, the cold storage machine industries and those industries which produce solvents and insulating foams the cfcs react with ozone molecules and convert the ozone to oxygen and the oxygen doesn't have the property of stopping the uv rays from the sun as the ozone only ozone has the capacity to filter the uv rays not the normal oxygen so now you can see how the ozone is getting depleted by the cfc the cfc will release the chlorine which will in turn decompose the oxygen molecule which will decompose the ozone molecule into oxygen the normal oxygen which will not have the capacity to filter the uv rays now what happens what happens if the ozone layer is damaged now you can see there is what are called as the holes in the ozone layer now you can see in this picture there are certain patches in the ozone layer where it is empty so that means there those places the ozone has been converted into oxygen and which doesn't have the capacity to filter the uv radiation that means the uv radiation can directly enter into our atmosphere now what happens if the ultraviolet rays enter into our environment lots of problems are created one example is skin cancer and cataract being caused in human beings other effects will be the physio physiological activities and the development of plants and animals are adversely affected for example the phytoplankton population in the oceans will be affected which will result in an imbalance in the environment because the phytoplankton are the producers in the ocean if their population is affected if the food chains and the food webs will be highly affected so that will have an imbalance in the environment there will be a disturbance in the levels of gases in the atmosphere which may in turn affect the biogeochemical cycles like the carbon cycle we have to deal with something called as garbage crisis now what is a garbage in our daily activities we generate a lot of material that are just thrown away and these materials are called as garbage these materials generally can be classified into two types first type is the biodegradable waste the biodegradable waste are substances which are broken down by the biological processes and which can be converted into less harmful nature so these are called as the biodegradable waste by certain chemical processes of living organisms body composes this can be 
broken down. So these are examples of biodegradable waste. And another kind of waste is non-biodegradable waste. These are substances which cannot be broken down by biological processes and hence they are called as non-biodegradable. These are the examples of non-biodegradable waste like the plastics, the metals, etc. So these cannot be broken down by biological processes. Now let us understand few questions that might come up. There is a question, how will you help to reduce the waste, suggest any two measures. The first and foremost thing is that you should stop generating the waste itself. That means you have to make changes in your lifestyle. So for example, you go out shopping, you can take a carry bag. You need not rely on the carry bag, the plastic carry bag that you get from the shop. By changing your lifestyle, you can help reduce the production of the waste itself. And the other measure can be segregating the waste properly. You can segregate the biodegradable and the non-biodegradable, the hazardous and the non-hazardous waste in such a way that it can be disposed of safe. Which of the following are environment friendly practices? Carrying cloth bags to put purchases while shopping, switching off unnecessary lights and fans, walking to school instead of getting your mother or anybody else to drop you on her scooter, all the above. The answer is all the above because whatever practice you adopt among these will be environment friendly which will not cause harm to the environment. Which of the following groups contain only biodegradable items? Here it is a quite tricky question. So, they will give you four options and a sub option where you have to choose. For example, A, B, C and D. A as grass, flowers and leather grass, wood and plastic, fruit pea, cake and lime juice, cake, wood and grass. Now your option here is those, the group which contains only biodegradable items. Now there is only one group which has a non-biodegradable waste, the plastic. So now the option will be another A which will have A, B, C or B, C, D or A, C and D or B, C and A. So whatever it is, so, if the option is having B, it should be dropped because it has got non-biodegradable waste. So, you have to choose A, C and D which has got the biodegradable items only. Now, how can you help in segregating the waste at home, at school or in the society? So, these can be uh, asked separately or together. So, at home, you have to segregate the waste properly using the right kind of bin and at school you know what are the measures you have to adopt at school and even in society by segregating the waste properly and disposing the waste correctly. Now what are the effects of ozone layer on our environment? Now what is this question? You have seen questions about depletion of ozone layer, the effects of depletion of ozone layer. Now, this is a question where it asks the effects of ozone layer on environment and you have to say that it protects our environment from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. So, it helps to maintain the living organisms and the life on the earth. There is yet another question, what are the effects of biodegradable waste on the environment? We all know that Non-biodegradable waste will have certain harmful effect. It's similarly, biodegradable waste also have harmful effects if it increases in quantity. So, if it increases in quantity, it results in pollution of all kind, the soil pollution, the air pollution, the water pollution, everything is resulted because of the biodegradable waste piling up in the environment. What are the effects of non-biodegradable waste on the environment? Now, all of you know that it causes phenomena like biomagnification and it also impacts the balance of the environment. Now, what are the advantages of using cloth bags for shopping instead of plastic bags or what is the advantage of the government's decision of, of banning plastic and other bags? Now, your answer should be very diplomatic. So, now you have to think and answer. So, what are the advantages of cloth bags is the same as the banning of plastic or 
other non biodegradable substances because it will help in maintaining the ecological balance it will help in reducing the waste produced by our society so it will which will in turn help in the maintenance of the environment so hope all of you have noted down certain points and all the best for your exams do well thank you ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ ವಾಣಿಯ ನಾವು ನೋಡಿ ಕಲಿಯುವ ಪರೀಕ್ಷಾ